Let's talk a little bit about chromosomes. And I've put two definitions in here for you. And I think both are useful and we'll talk through both. So let's start here. A chromosome is an entire chain of DNA along with a group of stabilizing proteins. So two key things there, an entire chain of DNA with a group of stabilizing proteins. So with this beautiful illustration, by the way, um, kindly permitted from the National Human Genome Research Institute, thank you for allowing us to use this. Um, from this definition and within this image, we can see this reasonably clearly. We've got a chain of DNA here. We can see that nice and clean. And we see it's eventually being wrapped and wound back into our X-shaped, tightly packed chromosomal format here. But the other point is, and I'm not going to really spend any time on this, we can also see these little supporting proteins, these kind of little yellow uh, discs here and they are stabilizing proteins they're called histones I'm not going to go anywhere near that today but just so you know they're in there and they're actually quite important well they're extremely important the second definition I'd encourage you to consider and also to learn is that the nucleus of all eukaryotic cells so the nucleus of all eukaryotic cells you know animals and plants are great examples contain chromosomes made of dna molecules now of course if we were talking about and i will do this later on if we were talking about prokaryotic cell cells things like bacteria of course they wouldn't be bound in a nucleus that's why we're talking about eukaryotic cells here so just just be aware of that and if, if I just now relate to this image for a few minutes time, we see here that we have kind of our a tightly bound X-shaped chromosome structure here, and it's kind of been brought out of the nucleus for, to, for us to look at. And if we look at this part, we can see the unraveling of the DNA coil, the proteins which stabilize. And if you follow it through, we can even look down into the individual proteins that make up the DNA code, of course. So this is not a view we would really be able to see apart from in this kind of animated form, but it's useful for us to be able to see that. The other point I would make, and it kind of fits in neatly here, is that if we look kind of at this point and we see this sort of haze here, we could make an assumption that this section uh, of this chromosome is what we call a gene. And remember that a gene codes for a protein. A gene codes for a protein. That's the role it undertakes. Okay, so a gene codes for a protein. So what we can say there, I mean, just looking at the, this illustration, is that each chromosome contains many genes. So let's put that in there. Let's put that each chromosome, each chromosome, each chromosome contains a large number of genes. Contains a large, I'm going to be two words, number of genes. And in um, in organisms, different genes will be turned on and off depending on where that chromosome and where that nucleus, where that cell actually is, which tissue is it living in, and therefore which proteins does it want to code for. And I'll talk a bit more about this, but genes can be switched on and can be switched off. Now, the other point I'd make to you before we move on is that in body cells, in body cells, in body cells, in body cells, chromosomes are normally found in pairs. Chromosomes, chromosomes are normally found in pairs, are normally found in pairs, found, just track down, in pairs. And let me show you that straight away, in pairs. Let me show you that straight away. If we have a look at this illustration here, don't worry too much about the, the pancreatic and the cellular illustration here at the moment, but if we have a look at this this illustration here, this is what we call a, the human carrier type, okay? In other words, it is 23 pairs, well actually it's 22 pairs plus the the sex um, chromosomes down here, either XX or XY, we'll study that in another tutorial. And what what's happened here is they've been arranged from the largest pair to the to the smallest pair. And the point I really want to draw out to you here, if we think about pairs just for a moment, pairs of chromosomes, we get one copy, one copy from the mother, okay, one copy from the mother, or from our mother, we could say, and we get one copy, one copy from the father. So we get a full set of chromosomes from both of our parents. That's really our, bi our biological parents. And that's a really important point to stress, okay? Now, 
With that in mind, in future studies, we'll start to consider how those um, those those pairs actually kind of interact, and and why uh, the features of say a human being would lean towards those of the mother or would lean towards those of the father. So, another point I want to make to you is that, of course, what we've got here is we've got effectively twenty two plus. Uh, our gender pair, our sex chromosomes, we effectively, as human beings, we have 23 pairs. And in the vast majority of cells, all 23 pairs of chromosomes can be found. So if we were to take a pancreatic cell, which we'll look at in a second, if we were to take a cardiac muscle cell, if we were to take a brain cell, we would find all 23 pairs in every single cell. Just be aware that there are some human cells that don't have 23 pairs. So for example, if we look at our gametes, our sperm cell and our, or our ovum, they only contain a single set. So they don't contain pairs, they, they contain 23 chromosomes, but not in pairs, just 23 single chromosomes. And we also have other cells such as red blood cells that apparently don't seem to have the space for a nucleus and therefore, uh, because they've got to carry all that oxygen, therefore they, they, they don't have the chromosome structure that we're talking about here. So there are exceptions, but just be aware that if we were talking about animals, if we were talking about plants or different animals to human beings, talking about plants, they don't necessarily have 23 pairs. They could have far, far fewer than that, but they, but they are normally in pairs, but they are normally in pairs, okay? They are normally in pairs. So that figure of 23, I mean, 23 pairs that is. Think about that really as a human characteristic at this point, okay? Now, I also wanted to draw your, your attention to this, this image here. What we have is we have the pancreas. I say it's only, it's only sort of an animated image or it's a designed image, but we, we have here pancreatic cells. And the point I wanna make about pancreatic cells, and we really could have chosen a whole host of other examples here, but with pancreatic cells, if we were to look at the cells within this tissue, what we would see here, or if, if it was viewable easily, we would find that the insulin gene, the insulin gene is turned on, okay, is turned on, all right? And what we'd find is that this gene, and remember, remember that genes, genes code for proteins, okay? So insulin as a protein, okay, these cells within this pancreas, I'm drawing them way too big, of course, these cells, they have the gene for insulin production turned on. And as a result of this, they code for the production of that insulin. Of course, that insulin uh, performs um, functions such as reducing blood glucose levels, for example. So if we compare that to the chromosomes within a muscle cell, for example, a muscle cell, it contains, or the chromosomes within the muscle cell contain the gene for producing insulin, but within the muscle cell, that gene for coding for that protein is switched off, whereas the genes for coding proteins which are relevant to the muscle cell are switched on. Now, the last point I wanna make here before we look at one final thing is I want you to actually have a look at some, some human cells that we've got in this, this illustration here, okay? Let me draw, write this in orange. <clears throat> the point I wanna make here is that if we look at the chromosomal structure within the nuclei, the different nuclei here, we have some examples where the chromosomes are tightly packed. So let's, let's just zoom in, see if I can actually zoom in and make this image a little bit bigger for you. Let me just zoom in here. So if we look here, if we look here, we have got some examples here, here, let me do a different color, here, 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 where we've got the chromosomes are tightly packed within the, in the nucleus. But then we've got some other examples here, here, where the chromosomes are almost what we could call like a noodle, in like a noodle type structure. Okay, so sometimes chromosomes are tightly packed and sometimes they are noodle-like or less tightly packed, we might say, less tightly packed. Now, I'm not gonna get into the terminology of that today. We will study that, I'm sure, at some other time together. We'll, we'll look at the terminology of that. But for now, I just want you to know you might see these different structures when, when you look at such things. Now, finally, 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 I keep saying that today, don't I? And you're probably thinking, James, this is never ending. I just want to remind you how it would work for a prokaryotic cell. So let me just give you a rudimentary illustration of the prokaryotic cell. We have the cellular membrane. We have the cell wall outside. I'm not gonna get into any kind of flagella or anything like that. But what I do wanna illustrate is that in a, 
in a pro let me write this in here in a prokaryotic cell think bacteria is a good example uh, prokaryotic cell what we have here is we have bacterial chromosomes or chromosome I should say bacterial chromosome here it is and we can describe that as a single loop but just be aware that again that single loop has numerous genes and because it has numerous genes this cell can produce or <coughs> it can synthesize numerous different proteins now the only other point I would make is as we said before we also have additional rings of DNA which we refer to as plasmids.